Friends and partners, employer branding experts and experienced professionals, welcome to the second edition of Employer Branding Summit hosted by Oddwork. My name is Charles Sinclair, I'm Head of Employer Branding at Oddwork and together with my friend, colleague and CEO, Poyan Karimi, we are looking forward to guide you through 25 minutes of inspiration and hands-on knowledge from some of the most proficient and influential employer branding experts that we have ever had the favor to come across. We're an employer branding company, transforming our partners' employer brands with one clear goal in mind, to attract, recruit, and retain their talents on today's competitive talent market. On the 28th of May this very year, in the midst of a global crisis that is indeed still changing the game itself and the rules of how it is played, we decided to run the very first employer branding summit. We were unsure what the reception would be, but we invited some of the greatest minds that we could find in our network to, to discuss the current and the future state of the employer branding industry. And the reception fell out way beyond our expectations. 350 exclusively invited guests attended and 100% of the surveyed participants answered that they would love to attend a following employer branding summit. So guys, here we are again, this time over 700 exclusively invited participants of team of odd workers supporting us to answer your questions in the chat and with a new lineup of great speakers. Welcome. The first employer branding summit took off in the beginning of the crisis with a focus on how different companies have acted in different ways to take on the, well, let's say rocky road uh, lying ahead. Today, we will switch our focus. We will leave the pandemic for 70, 75 minutes and we will set sail toward the future. 2020 is heading for an end. And let's just take a moment and thank every single God there is or might be or might be found for that. And this is the time to zoom out and take on the rest of the 20s, because this is it. This is the 20s, and it is the decade where employer branding runs into its teenage years. And when you are looking towards the 20s, and when you talk about company culture, company culture is not by any means a new subject. There are hundreds, thousands of books written about corporate culture from earlier days than most of us in this very digital space were even working with the subject. Kotter and Heske, two prominent researchers in the field of corporate culture and performance, released a report already back in 1992, where they depicted the connection between corporate culture and performance within a company. And their results were quite stunning. What they showed was that there is no simple connection between any given strong corporate culture and performance. So that's really interesting. Already back in 1992, they showed that there is no connection between any given strong corporate culture and performance. So, I mean, what does that mean? Well, the research showed that any given strong culture does not automatically mean organizational performance. What if the culture is wrong? What if it leads us in the wrong direction? Just because we do have a strong culture, does it necessarily help us to fulfill the right strategic goals? Relevant questions asked by highly relevant people already back in 1992. But what the research did show, however, was that there is a connection, a very strong connection between a strong and strategically correct corporate culture and a company's performance. That there is a connection between a strong and strategically correct, or as they put it, adaptive culture and a company's long-term performance. So what is a strategically correct and adapt adaptive culture? One obviously asks oneself. Well, Kotler and Heskett's answer to that question is a culture that helps a company move towards its strategic goals. That means a culture that is optimized and adapted to the strategic goals and market conditions of that very company. So if your own strategic goals do need people, do employees to be able to be fulfilled, then employer branding and being able to attract, recruit and retain the right talent becomes crucial to your organization's ability, to every organization's ability to reach its strategic goals. Really interesting thoughts. And we will dive deep into this uh, together with our speakers here today. We will. And so, so what decade do we leave behind? Uh, even if corporate culture has been a central discussion in businesses for a very long time, it is safe to say that the past decade, the tens, if you will, was the decade when employer branding exploded. In, in many cases, driven by tech companies, the war for talent was declared over and the talent won. M many companies took immense action to move the perception of themselves as an employer, and those actions soon changed the game for all of us. 
Some companies took great leaps in regards to their employer brands and some didn't. At the very same time, the, the talent perception of companies and the judgment of the very same has changed a lot. With everyone reading guest reviews before booking a hotel today, or at least pre-corona or hopefully soon post-corona, would it not be safe to say that talents will do the exact very same in the near future with their employers? Many of us in this digital space acknowledge this through the past decade and the explosion of employer branding was a fact. But if the tens was the decade when it exploded, what will happen now when employer branding moves into its teenage years? Will the projected image of a company's culture on social media be enough? Haven't we seen enough ping pong tables and happy Shutterstock pictures already? We're pretty sure we have. And we see that transition, transition happening before our eyes with our partners. Employer branding has moved into the boardrooms, the management teams. It's been given a budget and respect. And the 20s, would be a decade of execution, but exactly how? That is what we are to discuss with our speakers today, live from the Old Work headquarters in Gothenburg, Sweden. We're glad to say welcome to the second edition of the Employer Branding Summit. Charlie, let's take a look at the agenda. Well, let's do that because we do have some really interesting 75 minutes ahead of us. Um, so first, uh, we will be listening into Linus Jonkman, author and culture expert. I'm sure many of you know him already. And he will be talking about how to create sustainable company cultures and face the new HR challenges, uh, challenges that I think many of us can relate to uh, of the 20s. Uh, so Linus is, is first out. Uh, then we have the pleasure to welcome Penilla Fischione from, from uh, Defense Group Saab. And she will be talking about strategic workforce planning as a foundation for employer branding. And after that, we will be listening into Vasco Castro, Global Employer Branding Leader at Inca Group, and he will be talking about a really fascinating subject, how the employer brand and the consumer brand is blending together, how they are moving more together. Um, and finally, uh, really interesting with Frederick, happy to have him here today, Head of Partnerships at Team Taylor, and he will be talking about how can we create the best candidate experience based on the latest data and the insights. So, uh, guys, as you've already seen, we see that the chat is all fired up, which is great. Uh, it will be on all throughout the summit, obviously. And we do encourage you today to feel free to ask questions to the speakers. So what we are planning to do here today together with you is to bring up one or possibly, if we do find a time for each speaker, questions live to the speaker in question. However, um, as we are sure that there will be quite a fair amount of questions throughout the uh, the afternoon. Uh, even though we will not be able to answer uh, all questions uh, live here today, uh, our support team from Oddwork will collect all questions that will be asked and all the speakers have happily agreed to answer all questions after the summit and get back to you with a reply. So please do feel free uh, to ask your questions right in the chat uh, and we will bring them up or we will answer them afterwards. Uh, and if you have any technical support issues throughout the summit, just email EBS, Employer Branding Summit, EBS at oddwork.se and they will help you out. Um, and we will have a raffle here today where you'll be able to win uh, Linus Jonkman's new book or possibly Corporate Culture and Performance. And you are automatically part of the raffle simply by providing your feedback in the survey that will be sent out after the summit. So we always want to improve for you guys. We want to uh, make this platform as valuable for you as possible. So all feedback is highly valuable. So we hope you want to get back to that, uh, get back on that. And if you do, uh, you are automatically part of the raffle. And Poyan, I know that you want to uh, take the temperature uh, yeah. of the room right away. Uh, indeed, I will, because uh, we're approximately 700 people in this digital space uh, at this very point, and we want to, we do want to involve you guys as well. So throughout the session, we will send out a couple of polls, starting with the first one right away, uh, to get your uh, uh, your inputs on on certain questions. And we will start with the question that will pop up on the right hand side of your screen in just one second. In regards to employer branding efforts, how will your employer branding efforts develop in the 20s? Will you increase the efforts? Will they be, be roughly the same as in the past decade? Will you decrease them or are you not sure? We see over 80 answers increasing the efforts. That represents 82% approximately. Our efforts will be roughly the same and seven, um, 10% uh, at this very point. No one will decrease. One, one person is going to decrease. <laughs> Uh, their efforts. Uh, we hope to give you tools, inspiration, and guidance to, to increase them, or uh, at least to, to re-evaluate after this session, and 7% not be in short. Thank you, guys. And we will do use the poll uh, polling system to um, get your inputs throughout the 
session. And also, again, please feel free to qu ask questions in the chat. We love to see you guys involved here as well. What do you say, Charlie? Are we ready to get going? I think so. I mean, uh, let's welcome uh, our first guest, should we not? We should. Our first guest today is often called one of the most inspiring, progressive and forward thinking really culture experts in Europe. He's an author, he's a lecturer and an employer branding advisor with an interesting background from both IT and people and organization. His five years at the Swedish comparison site Prisjak put himself and a company on the national employer branding map with honest, funny, inspiring job ads that actually went viral as just an example of the employer branding tactics in play. Often seen on national morning shows, Linus is the master of the subject right and wrong cultures and the implications they might have. What boundaries do culture build within our, an organization? And how can it effectively be used as a tool of guidance? Where have wrong cultures led organizations in the past? And how do you create sustainable cultures and what new HR challenges do we face in the 20s? Let's find out. You're already on the digital stage. Welcome, Linus Jonkman to Employer Branding Summit. Thank you very much, Poyan. Wonderful. I'm very glad to be We're here. We're glad to have you. Let's jump right into it. Closing the 10s, moving into the 20s. What happened in regards to, to Employer Brand and in the last decade? And what are your projections for the 20s? Ooh, well, looking back at the past, I'm uh, this is this is half time for me because uh, I'm because I'm, I'm young enough to be inspired and you know feeling the, the the want to be part of the new work life but I'm still old enough to remember some of the trends that has gone and you know that has caused a buzz in the past and I think there's always somehow uh, lots of learning to do just from looking backwards so one thing I have experienced is that I've seen like this transition in employer branding, which is kind of strikingly similar to the kind of transition that we as humans do, meaning that it has kind of moved from the superficial, because in the beginning when we talked about employer branding, it was about superficial stuff, like those web pages with the Shutterstock photos you mentioned, and it was about showing up at different you know, events and handing out candy to students and trying to get high rated on lists of, no. And, and then somehow about five years ago, there was a switch and employer branding became soul searching and it kind of went inwards instead and started sort of looking at, at internal stuff. And there was what much more of the, uh, the buzz revolving around the core, you know, about the culture, the way we do stuff, being genuine, speaking, you know, with an authentic voice, having ethics. So uh, that's what I've seen as, as, a, as a part of the past. Yeah. And one thing that I also noticed was that I used to talk about the generational shift back in 2009. I wrote, wrote the book about it at that time. And that was a very hot topic at that time. And when we talked about some of those ideas and concepts for what the new generation would expect, I recall that those ideas, they were perceived as being very controversial and unrealistic because we talked about shorter cycles of feedback, you know, moving away from one, uh, one discussion a year into, you know, those one-on-one -on -one talks and we talked about result-oriented workplaces where we don't, didn't focus on time. Um, and we talked about actually tailor, ta you know, tailoring the work experience to people based on their individual interests. I, I used to have this example of if you had someone who was a, a kite surfing enthusiast, that person would probably love a workplace where you could come late some days when it's really windy. And, and those ideas, like I said, were considered as really unrealistic by a very large group of people. And today, I would say, looking back, that that is the norm today. That's what really signifies progressive companies. And in the startup cultures, that is pretty much a, a given, that you can, of course, tailor suit the work life that you do to the kind of interest that you have. Um, I, I do remember specifically, I talked about role, the results only work environment philosophy that was invented by Best Buy. Uh, which also has had that focus that you don't really talk about time, you just look at the performance. And now, in, in the state where we're in now, if you just look at what's happening, I, I kind of think that the time that we had prior to COVID and the time that we have now during COVID, I think if we, if we strike them together and we get a hybrid, I think that hybrid is going to be how we perceive the work set up in the future, which basically means that I think a lot of companies will cut down on the amount of square feet they use. And I think that forever, the idea that it's kind of shameful to tell people that you're working from home will also go away because we have proven now that this works very well. That's really interesting. So, yeah. So, so, so in the future, I think 
yes, if I just look really far ahead, I think that a lot of the inspiration that we will see is uh, it comes from IT because when IT was young as a parallel, it took all their, their ways of working from the established work life. So IT started working with waterfalls and then pretty sudden it came out with the conclusion that there were better ways to do things. So IT invented agile and other ways of working. And all of a sudden, it's the other way around that the, the student became the master and now everyone wants to be agile and work with teals and you know, holocracies and uh, autonomous teams and things that are IT concepts. So if we look forward for future trends, I think IT is the place where we should actually look. We should look at what the new cutting edge of IT does right now in terms of work processes. And then it will probably give us a very good you know, uh, perception of, of what's about to come. That's really interesting. That's a, that's a good tip. Thank you very much. You, you, you do not only talk about right culture, uh, you also talk a lot about wrong culture. Could you give us a glimpse in on that? Well, I think culture can be like opinions. I mean, you can have a strong opinion and you can be super wrong. So there's definitely the strong and wrong. And when I think about cultures that do that, I think I, I typically point to performance culture, the kind that makes it imp impossible for, for people to stay in the long run, meaning that is the setup is not sustainable. Like It's like they might have a crunching culture and people might feel that, okay, I, maybe I can manage two years, but then I'm going to go away and do something really reasonable <laughs> somewhere else. And also often when you look at the way they reward people, the way they incentivize people to move upwards with weird role titles, job titles that just get longer and have more and more you know, pronounced to it. Uh, it kind of builds this idea that they're based upon the premise of extrinsic motivation. Uh, and what it lacks usually is a sense of psychological safety. Most people go there and they have this public version of themselves that they use from eight to five. And the company in itself doesn't really either, either care that much about that there is a person outside of the eight to five. I think that that will be one of the things that signifies the strong and wrong cultures, the performance cultures that doesn't have a soft side to it because you can still perform, but it doesn't have a soft side. It looks at people as resources. Really interesting. You've written books about this, but I'm going to ask you the question, how can culture be used as a tool of guidance within, within an organization? Um, I always think that when you read the culture statements that people have, it should be like you're reading someone's autobiography. It should describe this collective thing that is a, more like a being rather than just stiff bullet points. Um, so it's, it, should, it should feel to you like you're reading about an individual or a character. Um, and that, any understanding of a character is like a list of do's and don'ts and a sense of I, I prioritize this before that because it builds the idea of what the, the ethics is. So I, I feel that in the process of defining culture this way that you're describing, uh, we shouldn't get, get stuck on just, you know, having three words on a wall. We should think more along the lines of ethics and use that as an input, like how, how should you, for example, uh, handle an employee that just got, got dumped and is performing under par because of this? Should we ignore that person? Should we address it? Should we be understanding? Um, because questions like this would, would outline the culture and make it clearer sentence by sentence, what kind of a company we are, and therefore which decisions we should or shouldn't be making. So a strong, strong company culture is by definition a strong sense of ethics. The autobiography reference is really, really good. Um, the, the story of the company, the autobiography, the, the, the honest truth uh, of what it is. Um, uh, the topic for, for yourself today is uh, how to build a sustainable company culture and what new HR challenges we do have in front of us in the 20s. So I'm going to ask it as a question. Uh, what is a sustainable mm -hmm. company culture? How is it created? What new HR challenges do, do you see? Okay, in, in one sentence, what describes it to me at least and has meaning to me, uh, and I learned this from experience by working in companies that didn't have that kind of a culture. To me, it's the idea that there is a sine curve to each person, meaning that everyone is a sine curve that goes up and down rather than a high performer that will always stay a high performer because everyone will have those aspects in life where we will go through maybe a separation or maybe our kids have problems in school or we, and we contract diabetes or whatever. There will be things that goes up and down. And this, the thing that signifies a sustainable company culture is the kind of culture that has the margins for that, that allows you for that, that kind of reach outside 
of the work to give you a helping hand because that's the kind of an, of an employer where you want to that you feel connected to where you want where you want to belong so i would say that the sustainable companies they don't see resources and that's why i have a hard time dealing with the word of human of hr as human resources and prefer the term of people because progressive companies tend to look at people like people they see someone who who coaches little league soccer and who makes their own cheddar cheese and who has kids and you know there's room for that that's really interesting so that's what signifies great companies in my perspective. And thank you, Linus. So we have a couple of questions in the chat uh, as well, and I'm going to take them uh, live. Uh, we have um, two questions that are uh, in the same category, so we're going to take that first. Um, you will see the question pop up on the, on the screen as well. Can you give us some tips on building a strong culture in a remote world post-COVID? Well, I think the traditional tips would be to first start from the beginning and do everything with the core, with the things we say, and then also define what it means. And it's the definition thing that is usually the friction, you know, where you actually have to connect the things you're saying that you're standing for and having some kind of a, of a behavior and maybe changes to the work process that you have that make it actually happen. So I think it's always about looking at what we say and looking at what we do. So for example, if we talk about that, you know, um, that the team is very important, for example, we say that the, the team is everything in this culture, then, then of course the team should be invited and be part of the same process that puts people in your team, meaning the recruitment. So for each and every process that you have, you should always make sure that you do what you say you, you know, you're supposed to do. So the answer to the question is always back to the statements that we make. What is the perfect purpose that you claim that you have? What is the behavior you, you put on the walls or in your culture manifest? That's where you'll find the true answer to the things that you should be doing. Interesting. We, we do have time for, uh, for one more question from the audience as well. Well, I'll, I'll have to keep the short answer, but um, what if a company is not really there yet in terms of culture, but working on it? How can we still attract future talents and compete with more interesting organization from an employer branding perspective? That's not, that's not an easy one to, finish, to, to answer quickly. No, I think everyone is always on the journey because culture is a process and not a project. A project has an ending date, but a, a, a culture doesn't. But I think uh, the winning concept is always to be transparent. I mean, if you told me that, it would mean something interesting because it means that I can help you build this culture rather than that it's already defined and set in stone. And I mean, all things considered, there's still a human factor that we love to feel responsibility, but only for the, the things that we have been part of building. So it's actually more attractive to tell someone that we are in the process of defining the culture rather than telling you that it's done. Yeah. You know, we have this castle, come live in it. The other way is actually more. Yeah, really interesting. So transparency, ge someone wrote genuine also in, in the chat, uh, authenticity, uh, on, uh, transparency, the word is too hard for me to pronounce. Thank you very much, Linus. We will finish uh, our talk here also with your top three recommendations for the 20s. What would that be? Oh, sure. Yeah, let's think. Um, the first thing I like to think about is I, I call this concept the goals without holes, which is that it is pretty much a recommendation, recommendation based on the incredible pace of changes that we have today. So waterproof goals is to assign goals um, and performance to an individual, but that doesn't link to salary development. Because for the, then, then you will find that you will have more of a number of ideas tried rather than number of successful ideas. Because with number of ideas tried is a much better measure in the times we're living now. Or it, it's more an, 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 a race to fail very fast and try many things. So for this, this reason, I would recommend to use, except for example, OKRs as a way of setting goals for everyone, for teams, for organization, because OKRs has that overarching philosophy that uh, succession is not linked to monetary development, which is super interesting in terms of innovation. Then I would say that we have to write culture bestsellers because it's all about stories. So you write a bestseller. And what I mean is that your statements about culture, values, mission, vision, purpose, anecdotes, or whatever you call it, they need to be more than those bullet points. It needs to be written in a way that makes you shine, uh, that captivates the reader. It needs love and storytelling. So think of it like a book and ask yourself, would I read this? 
because if you wouldn't then get back to it and uh, apply as much love and focus as you need to make it interesting and the third thing and this this is something I've, i see and i find very interesting is the idea about the autodidactics rising i mean the, the people that are self self-taught because what has happened during these 10 years is that the, you had services like google scholar or khan academy which means that in a, in a different time and space, school was like a confinement of information. And in order to get that information, you had to go to school. But nowadays, you don't. Now you can fall in love with a topic like, say, personality psychology. And then you have all the surveys and all the reports ever produced available for you at your fingertips. So that th this makes for some really passionate autodidactic people that just comes from nowhere. And when you look at the disruption of our industries and of our, you know, the different disciplines, we are being disrupted at all points from people who have no previous experience from it. So one thing that I have also seen empirically in my work that sometimes you will encounter these people that has absolutely no schooling, but are so damn good at what they do, both in IT and HR actually, you will find these people that are just self-taught. And in the olden days, we used to always put the hygiene factor that someone should have a high school diploma before we even invented them to make a, a competence test. So I, I think the best way to deliver on that promise, to let the autodidactics in, is to have a competence-based recruitment process. Because in that case, everyone will shine with the light that they bring in. You won't be fooled by other variables that aren't as relevant anymore as they used to be. Thank you. And thank you very much, Linus. Autodidactics, that is a new word for me uh, today, and I appreciate it very, very much. Thank you for joining us at the Employer Branding Summit. Uh, you, you have tons of more questions in the chat. We will send them all to you and uh, to all our attendees here today as well. We will answer all questions. Linus, always a pleasure. Thank you very, very much. Thank, thank you, Linus. Thank you very much. Wow. Difficult words, two of them. Authenticity yeah. and, uh, yeah. Autodidactics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll get back to you in the end of the summit. Yeah. No, a really interesting talk. Thank you very much. And I mean, it, it, it's so interesting always to listen to Linus, I think. Uh, and especially when you think about it, how he paints up the handing candy out to students at career fairs. And then you compare it to, to the soul searching uh, that we see today. Um, thank you for a great talk. And, and guys, we will move on. Uh, and, oh, and there is Vasco in the picture. That's great. You know, Vasco, you're here already. I was going to plan, well, I was planning to bring Panilla up first, um, but <laughs> we will talk to you soon. Um, guys, I'll let you get that sorted. Uh, we're looking forward to speak to Vasco very soon. Uh, but before that, uh, guys, with employer branding moving up on the strategic agenda, as we've heard, the strategic workforce planning of companies has hit the boardrooms, the bodies, and the top of the strategic hierarchy. But how do you translate strategic goals into execution? What role does employer branding play upwards in the strategy and then on an operational day-to-day -day level? And once upon a time, Saab was world-renowned for building cars, but they do not anymore. The famous fighter jet just scraper, next generation submarines and state-of-the-art cybersecurity systems. These are just some of the highly interesting programs and business areas that they run today on a global level. And today, Saab serves the market of governments, authorities, and corporations with products in the defense industry and has over 17,000 employees dedicated to keeping people and society safe. And their scope has really spanned a lot throughout the last decades. And today, for example, one third of the world's aircrafts land on airports with the help of Saab's radar systems. And obviously, broader scope does mean broader competencies. So how do you translate business strategy into employer branding execution. Penilla Fiscione is the strategic workforce planning lead at the world's uh, leading defense company, and we are more than proud to have her explain the process to us. Penilla, welcome to Employer Branding Summit, and great to see you. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. <laughs> so, so great to have you here. And I think let, let's dive straight into it. Strategic yeah. workforce planning. Look, please explain your role and how it fits into Saab's overall strategy. Yeah. It's very important to have a strategic workforce planning process. So actually what I do is I try to help and support and also challenge our company and organization in how to say plan and act yeah. for the future so we can be prepared for our future needs. Uh, so the end goal is of course that we should have uh, the right mix of people and competences uh, at the right time, simply. Yeah. Simply. Oh, well, it's, uh, well uh, so, so this is really interesting then because uh, how would you say, wh where does employer branding sit on 
uh, in the strategic hierarchy of, of Saab. How important is employer branding to um, Saab as a leading defense organization? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's very important, and uh, how to say it's our senior vice president in HR or of HR who is responsible of employee branding, and uh, this position is uh, on our top management group, yeah. Yeah. and uh, we we talk about strategic workforce planning um, constantly uh, in this group, so it's on the on it's a top priority, yeah. and um, how to say. Indirect, we talk about employee branding since we have to plan for the future. So, uh, the end result of strategic workforce planning it is uh, an action list. It's a prerequisite, so we can actually uh, create uh, strategies and plans for our people processes. Yeah. Um, so it's um, it's something that is brought up constantly on the on the agenda for the top management group. Uh, so we actually, I mean, the, the most important part is that we create uh, actions, concrete actions, yeah. so we can move the, the company forward. So, so how, how how does that? Because I think that can be very interesting for for the audience yeah. to hear here today. Yeah. That we might have our people plans, uh, some sort of strategic workforce planning, different for different companies, obviously. But how how do you translate strategic workforce planning of tomorrow to employer branding activation and day to day work happening today, so to say? Yeah, but th this is the most interesting question, I believe, yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> <Go for it. laughs> for example, uh, within Saab, we have. Um, plans and strategies uh, up to 20 years forward from now on. Wow. Wow. So also we have to, to put strategic workforce planning into a context. The, the products that we're building now, some of them will be used until 2060s. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, so it means that we have to um, keep track of the competences or the capabilities that our employees must have so we can still maintain our products. Hmm. Um, and also to, I just want to mention, I mean, everyone has been working with workforce planning for so many times. It might have been, uh, how to say, called, uh, or you have the wording for resource and competence planning. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is that if you only look for competence or resource planning, what you probably have done in the past is that you have looked to your current workforce and only maybe planned for a year from now or on yeah, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, so what we have, since we have so such long plans that stretches so much, how say far into the future, yeah. we have to plan for the future scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, but workforce planning, it's a bit deceiving the wording because it's not just only planning because as uh, as I try to do here, I try to emphasize it's the actions that we would like to 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 get at. Yeah. So, the the planning gives us insights in where we should act. Mm. What kind of actions should we do? Yeah. So, I, I still need to evaluate or uh, develop this a little bit more. So, it's about foreseeing the future battlefield that that's oh, jesus okay that's so, not an, <laughs> yeah so that's not an easy job <laughs> so imagine i mean since it's a defense or we are in the defense industry yeah. how would the future battlefield look like yeah. and since our vision is it's a human right to feel safe we have to yeah. create defense systems so so we can uh, fulfill our vision yeah. all right so if um, if our products should have a capability then our employees should have the ability to create those products yeah. in the future. So it's uh, it's important to find the gaps. And I'm going to give you an example just to be more concrete. Is it okay? Yeah, I w please, because exactly, because I was getting, I, I know that you mentioned yeah. how you actually collaborate with universities and schools. Yeah, and, yeah exactly. This part, yeah. So I think it's, uh, I think it could be good for the audience just to have this example. Uh, yeah. Let's say, I, I know it's, um, a hot topic for for many companies it's uh, ai competence for example yeah. so uh, we as many others has identified the ai competence as a gap hmm. so what we do we have to in, we, we, okay we can we can split it into two different categories we have the internal engagement and external engagement hmm. so internally we have to find out okay 
who or where do we need to upskill or reskill? I mean, develop our employees. Yeah. Uh, can we do it now? How long time will it take? This answer or these answers will have an effect on who to attract and who to recruit. When can we recruit? Where can we recruit? Mm. So we have to simply, we have to create a pipeline where we have um, talents to attract to mm. us. So we have to uh, contribute to the society with uh, creating curiosity around um, techn technology, mm. how to create this interest about technology for, for our, I mean, for the kids around us. Mm. Uh, and also we have this dialogue with schools, uh, with the smaller, the smaller children, uh, just to encourage them to, uh, to um, yeah, be more curious about technology. Uh, and also we have the dialogue, or actually we have a tight relationship, a collaborations with uh, many universities where we, um, we, give, we give the universities the picture, our picture that we have about our future workforce. Yeah. That was yeah. so, uh, so good with all the videos uh, here in the intro because uh, <laughs> it, it yeah. actually touched upon the, uh, the future work. The challenges, yeah. Yeah, the challenges. <laughs> So if we would like to have uh, engineers within Saab that should have specific prerequisites or how to say competences and we would like them to have a life learning mindset where you have to be curious and you want mm. to, to learn all the time, then also the schools and the universities has to foster those uh, students mm. so they come then later on to us with this yeah. mindset already. So it's not only about the competences, it's very important, but it's also how we do things. Yeah, um, yeah so, uh, I mean, we have the collaborations with the universities. We are partners with the other industries. We see where we actually can um, help each other out to contribute to actually to Sweden, to, to keep Sweden to be in the forefront of technology. I mean, so that, I mean, I just find it personally so fascinating how you how you work with um, up to sixty or twenty sixty, yeah, and you try to track that all the way back, and and you even reach out to schools to to uh, drive initiatives to to make uh, talents employable, yeah, uh, in the upcoming years. Uh, Penilla, mm -hmm. thank you for that. Uh, we, we are on a fairly tight uh, schedule, and I see that so many interesting questions are building up. Uh, I'm sorry, but we do have to move on though to your top three recommendations uh, to yeah. the audience in connection to uh, to a strategic workforce planning or, or employer branding. What would they be from your side? From my side, it's um, if if you haven't started with strategic workforce planning and uh, the emphasis on strategic, the long the long term side, yeah. uh, it is to think big in the beginning start small, create uh, concrete actions, and then afterwards scale up. Start yeah. with your core areas and core competences. Don't do everything at all because uh, it, it might be messy. Mm -hmm. That was top one. The top two is use scenario planning. Uh, learn how to use your forecast data, but also force, foresight uh, mm -hmm. vision to use, um, to be able to, to actually scan the world around you to mm. prepare for the future. Because it's like the, the futurist uh, Peter Swartz said, he said that if you haven't thought about it, you're unlikely to see it in time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the third is also, um, since the, the everyone knows the, the speed of change, it will only go faster from now on. Mm. Uh, and this will require new knowledge and new expertise. Therefore, create this uh, self-directed learning culture Mm. Uh, where the responsibility lies with each and every one. Well, thank you very much for that, Penilla. Uh, really valuable uh, and great insights. And thank you uh, for sharing your experience with us here today. Uh, Poyan, what did you think about that one? Thank you, Pernilla. We have a t so many questions in the chat. Yeah. And we're, as promised, we will send them out and we will answer each and every one of them after the event. Thank you, Pernilla. I mean, the, the top level management being on board, the 20-year plan, the context of the SVP, really, really interesting. And we could, we could talk about this for, for hours and hours, but uh, we'll answer the questions after. Thank you very, very, Thank very you. much. Thank you, Pernilla. Uh, okay, Charlie, we're on a tight schedule, uh, interesting discussions, uh, lots of engagement in the chat as well, which makes us happy. 
to see. We have an Maybe. eager Vasco as well who wants to be on the digital stage as soon as possible. Trying so to what squish you, Penilla out like that, you know, like exactly. it's, it's typically Vasco. Uh, a typical yeah. Vasco, <laughs> typical Vasco, exactly. What do you say? Should we go on? Please go, go. Um, before introducing Vasco here, guys, we just wanted to, hey, Vasco, welcome on. You can be on stage while we do a poll as well. And uh, we just want to ask one question to you guys in the chat and just get your perspective on Panilla's talk as well. Vasco, you're very welcome to vote as well. The question that is popping up is how strategically prioritized is employer branding in your organization? Is the top management fully on board? Is it a focus area, but maybe not on the top level? we do have employer branding work but it's not a focus area or we don't do employer branding yet please cast your votes in the chat now we only have a few answers in uh, so far let's see if we can get more answers and we will, of course, after the event, send out a summary with the recommendations. Top management uh, on board the poll is, we have some technical issues with the poll and that just something that needs to be calculated for in a live event. So let's go on with Vasco. Uh, Vasco, uh, stay online while I'll introduce you. Uh, because we are thrilled to have you here, Vasco Castro from Inca Group. Inca is the biggest company in the IKEA franchise with 160,000 co-workers responsible for over 90% of the franchise's total revenue. IKEA, obviously one of the most prominent and essential brands and employer brands that Sweden has to offer is constantly found on top of both local and global rankings among presumptive candidates. But what is the culture really? Is it built upon the words and right doings of its notorious founder? Is it built upon its quirky Swedishness that has put the Swedish culture on the global scene as much as its own brand? Or is it simply the consumer brand, translated into an attractive employer brand that constantly keeps itself relevant? Vasco, eager to get on stage with a background as senior consultant at Universum now in the role of global employer branding lead at Inca, is here to explain the symbiosis of an employer brand and a consumer brand from one of the world's leading retailers' perspective. Vasco, finally, it's time. Welcome. Thank you so much, Brian. Are you sure it's time now to join? <laughs> it is. Now it's time. I promise you. Now it's time. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. I think uh, I think it's uh, it's actually great to, to be here and to be part of this uh, this meeting with more more people that work in employer branding. Uh, I think I think um, when uh, when it comes to to employer branding. At um, uh, at IKEA, there is a lot of uh, things that uh, that we are aiming at, uh, at doing this year. And and Poyan, we'll, you and I were discussing yeah. um, somehow uh, before this this conversation. Uh, what is it that uh, was the goal for employer branding at at Inc and at IKEA? And um, and I remember that I mentioned that it was to strengthen our employer brand. And uh, I think I think you and many more people get surprised when we actually say this. We uh, we are in many. In, many rankings that are done worldwide, one of the most attractive employers in the world. So what is it that we mean with wanting to strengthen our our employer brand? And this is actually quite quite important to actually go to the core of the the work that we want to do, especially when it comes to, to external employer brand. And, uh, and uh, uh, about a year ago, we did an external survey uh, ourselves with the uh, with the, the, the target groups, the external target groups that, that we want to recruit. And uh, and uh, and we realized that even though we are attractive, we might be attractive because of our consumer brand, um, and uh, and uh, not so much because of how people uh, understand who we are and what we stand for as a, as an employer. So so in this survey, we asked people uh, which one is your dream employer, and this is what, this is typically a recall question in which people can type any company that they want. So they are not prompted with, uh, with any company. And within our target groups, mostly retail, um, the, especially for Sweden, uh, most people wrote, uh, wrote IKEA. Uh, so, so we are extremely attractive, uh, uh, especially in Sweden, uh, as an employer for the, for the retail target group. However, when we ask the same people, uh, so what is it that you, you think it's like to work at IKEA? Uh, can you please describe how it is to work at IKEA? And, uh, and the, the most common answer is, I don't know, uh, or uh, the connections with the consumer brand. And this is, uh, this is extremely important, and especially important from a retention perspective. One of the reasons that uh, uh, why, why co-workers are so proud about working at, at IKEA has to do with the vision. Uh, so the vision to create a better everyday life for the many people. 
and um, and this is actually something that we see in in many internal surveys that we do however when we dig deep into the external data this the neither neither the vision um explicitly said in this way or anything remotely close to this appears in this perception and i think that in, in employer branding we need to be much closer in the external perception to the internal realities uh, However, and, and I think this is the, the, the important thing here, I will just wrap up because I know that you have many questions, uh, We uh, This helps us become more pragmatic and defining the goal of, uh, of, uh, of uh, employer branding and the activities that we want. And, and uh, right now we need to make sure that we, uh, uh, we create a, a perception that it is clear about how it is to work at IKEA. This will help a lot on making sure that we get the right people and then the, and then the, the right people also know what they are joining uh, uh, in in the organization and and the, if you think about us in sweden that we are extremely attractive and we don't have uh, such a clear perception externally I think now in in the other countries where we are maybe not number one two or three uh, the 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 goal the goal that we have makes us uh, understand that the actions that we need to take and the actions are probably more connected with activation, distribution of content and reaching out to the audiences to explain, to enter, to join dialogues about how it actually is to work at IKEA. So this, this, this understanding helps us on identifying a goal and being quite pragmatic and down to earth and simple and objective on defining how to best spend time and budget. And one follow-up question on that, being pragmatic. How is one pragmatic in this? Uh, just a very direct question. Uh, I, th I think uh, it's it's a very good point. Uh, point. You know, nowadays in, in employer branding, uh, as compared to employer branding in the past, uh, there is so many things that you can do. There are seas of research. Uh, there is uh, a lot of things that you can do from a strategic perspective. Um, you can do uh, uh, segmentation. You can do personas. You can do... EVPs, you can do uh, TVPs, the latest in employer branding, uh, especially when it comes to the external. And uh, and ultimately, uh, being pragmatic means how to best use our time and budget. And if you have, let's say, a thousand hours to put in employer branding, in order to create the biggest impact, do you want to put the, uh, the majority of these hours in creating strategy and then forgetting about the, the main reason why we do employer branding? In this case, connected with this goal, is, is to actually uh, create an understanding uh, within the external audiences and, and, and as such to focus on the distribution of content. And we'll come back to the assets and, uh, that every asset needs to count. We talked a lot about this um, before the summit together as well, but you've been in the game for a long time. And you've heard a lot of talk about the future, the future, the future. Us uh, people like Old Rourke, yeah, talking about the future, uh, a future that you then have seen. So to put it simple, not talking about the future, what should we be doing now? I think, I think the, the part of being pragmatic is it's a, it's a, it's a quite central uh, question. You know, the, we talk about the future, but, but I think it is important to start with putting the, the basics right. I was just talking about the fact that we, IKEA, uh, don't have a, a, a clear image, and, I, and there's a lot of studies showing uh, exactly the same. Obviously, if you if you force people to select something that is connected in, with an image, you get something. However, asking, go to the streets and asking people, uh, the people that you want to recruit, uh, how is it that you perceive um, yourself as an employer? This helps a lot. And there is actually a very famous, or maybe famous and at the same time obscure study in employer branding, uh, in which a group in Germany did uh, did MRI, so so basically brain scans, and uh, and they uh, it was functional MRI, so basically they they were able to uh, uh, show to uh, to candidates. In this case, I think it was students, uh, different logos of companies, and see which area of the brain were were activated. And uh, and by the way, these were people that knew which companies they wanted to work for. So before they enter in an MRI machine, they had to say. I still want, I, I want to work for the same company that I said a week ago or two weeks ago. So they really know, they really knew which companies they wanted to work for. And uh, and when when uh, they uh, they did the brain scan, they saw that two areas of the brain were activated. One was connected with emotion, which I think it's a it's an important part to play, especially in the creation of, of assets. But the other, which is quite interesting as well, is is connected with novelty. So for them, there was a, a, a connection with actually not knowing why they wanted to join this this organization and connecting these with for example the employer brand 
um, study that that we did on on the image it makes us realize that uh, that we have to be much simple and down to earth in what uh, what uh, we need to do it but it also makes us re re realize one more thing that um, right now people are making decisions on where to work where to spend a, a, a huge amount of of their time in a given company and we all know people that uh, that have joined our organizations and they have not been happy with the organizations they are not engaged uh, and either they leave or they are basically not not uh, not so uh, uh, motivated to to be there and and i think uh, we need to to make sure that we create this desire uh for people to actually find out more in the uh, about companies and when i mean we i actually don't mean ikea i mean all of us in in a larger employer branding community uh, that that maybe are not competing with each other i mean go back to the war of talent in, from the 90s maybe that is not the 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 step forward in which we see all of us as competitors, but rather we all come together to to uh, to compete with the Netflix and TikToks of this world and Instagram for time for people to actually uh, figuring out how to best uh, place themselves in uh, in an organization so that candidates also help um, help us uh, picking picking the right jobs and making the the right targeting. That's really, really interesting. And uh, that's a very interesting take. Um, I'll pick up one uh, question from the audience right here. Um, it's stated on the screen uh, before you right now. How important is it to segment your messaging and content when speaking to internal and external audiences? For Inca, are your messages very differentiated? Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. I think uh, uh, when it comes to, uh, to the messaging, it, uh, especially when, uh, when it comes to, to assets, we uh, we we have uh, segmentation just to put that clear uh, however uh, i think it's quite important to um, to and we didn't touch much on that to, to, on the importance of making sure that every asset counts more than uh, more than focusing on creating uh, specific assets for for specific segments we have that in place um, you know, you know, in the in the past, I've actually uh, done research that shows that uh, even not such a great assets and not so uh, specific assets to the different segments actually help people become more attracted and more aware of uh, of uh, different uh, different employers. Um, and uh, and uh, we can put an effort there, uh, and it all depends on uh, how much time, how much budget you uh, you can put uh, on segmentation versus just creating an asset that uh, that works for everyone in the organization and ultimately if you think about mobility in the organization maybe it it, it is still fine uh, to to take that approach so to simplify the approach on uh, on employer branding based on what is it that you can do within your realities Thank you. And we have more questions for you as well. We'll send them afterwards and send them out with this summary. And Vasco, your top three recommendations <laughs> for the this 20s. One quite fast. So the, the first one I talked about, which is the, the be pragmatic, uh, define clearly uh, your goal and then put put the time and, and resources and those are limited in, in, in focusing on that. The second, the second aspect is to, to make sure that every asset that we we have counts uh, for example in in marketing uh, there is usually a budget well, depending on on the company to have uh, tv ads on uh, going on 24 7. this is not our reality so we need we need to make sure that we grab people's attention and then with supporting copy we actually make people curious to wanting to actually find out more to actually shape this uh, this the, the right image and the right image is uh, very connected with identity so be pragmatic every asset counts and the third one it's uh, it's we in employer branding need to actually stick together to uh, i think i think we have a lot more to gain uh, by sticking together and uh, and trying to create a desire on people to actually find out more about about how it is to work at, uh, at different uh, places to find out uh, where is it that they would fit best where is it that they would actually uh, love to 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 work at and, uh, and the, here I actually have a suggestion for everyone in this call that I, I'm happy to, to connect with, uh, with uh, all of you in, uh, in uh, conversations. I usually do this in a, in a regular basis because uh, I understand that many times uh, the work in employer branding can feel quite lonely and, uh, and sometimes it's, it can be quite beneficial to actually 
uh, share some ideas with the, with the, with other colleagues that maybe have the same challenges. Some have some solutions. Some have uh, some ideas out how to go forward. So you can find me on LinkedIn and happy to connect with uh, with all of you. Thank you so much, Vasco. It's very generous of you. And we have more questions also sent out afterwards. So set a goal, set out, be pragmatic, set your tactics, make every asset count and help each other. Thank you very, very much, Vasco, for clear recommendations. Uh, we know you want to stay. We know you don't want to leave, but sorry, we have to go through in this <laughs> schedule. So Wonderful to see you, Vasco. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, wow, I mean, um, just really interesting as well, of course. And I, I love what Vasco is saying about the whole EB community uh, coming together and how we can all gain so much from that. I, I think many can relate to that, that it's, it's sometimes, uh, not in every organization, but I, I know that we see it a lot, that it, it's uh, more often than not, it's, it's quite a lonely job uh, still. Um, yeah. Final guest, ready? Indeed, I mean we are. I mean it's it's moving fast, is it not? But uh, we are ready for the final guest. So, um, guys, I mean we are uh, moving towards our friend Frederick Melanda, uh, final guest today, and he is head of partnerships at the fast growing scale up team Taylor. Uh, and team Taylor, if you have not been in contact with the brand, is a career platform and applications tracking system used by over. 3,500 different companies across the world now, and they have acquired a position in the absolute middle of the employer branding tech scene. And with their clear focus on the Canada journey, they made the streamlined career sites uh, the standard of the past decade. So what are the new standards of the 20s? Um, so and as Hendo Partnership, Frederick has teamed up with top of the line employer branding companies. Uh, Old Work is happy to be one of them. To, to offer the next generation of must-have tactics. And he is here to give us all a glimpse into the tech future of employer branding. Frederick, welcome and great to see you. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. It feels a bit strange to be able to share the scene with so many so smart people. And I feel like, like, what do I, why do I belong here? But I also see that, that to some extent, <laughs> like five years ago, I would never have imagined being here, but it's so good to be here. You know, still, and, and, and I mean, here you are, and I, I'm, I'm sure we are so confident that you will create great value here today because you, you have so much interesting insights and data. And I mean, just to, to, to dive into it, Frederick, mm -hmm. I mean, you are Team Taylor, um, and, and you are so focused, you guys, on the Canada experience and making it almost like perfect and constantly developing it. Just looking at the development of the candidate experience in 2010 mm -hmm. to today, what, what happened? What has happened? Yeah, so I think you first have to look back and understand and actually understand the status quo uh, that the candidate experience is closely tied to the com consumer or the customer experience that we have as private people. Uh, the personal lives and the professional lives you usually try to keep separate, but as a candidate, you are a really private person. You are a person trying to apply for a job. You don't represent any company, you represent yourself. And we see uh, in the last decade that there's been a surge of things that has changed our expectations about companies. This is stuff like Spotify and the, way the, the ease of use of listening to music, it's things like Netflix, how, how easy it is for you to uh, watch a film. Uh, and we know that these things are closely tied to what we expect in uh, new companies as well when we're trying to apply for companies because we expect that ease of yeah. use. Uh, things like everyday items such as smartphones as well and the, the accessibility of all, like the entire world in our pockets has made us uh, more curious to some extent as well. And it's now something that everybody uses instead of just some, some few people like 10 years ago. Um, yeah. So, but, but if we go back and look at what's, what's changed and what's due to change is we've become less patient. Uh, we expect more, we expect more communication. We expect things to be easier. We expect more clear communication. Uh, we want to know what's going on. We want to know what's next. And we want to hear the truth. Uh, we want to actually know what's happening. We want to, don't want to see the, the painted picture and the perfectly painted picture of what they're showing on their website. We want to actually hear the truth from what the employees and the people actually working there. And this, of, of course, is something that has been really important in the last decade as well but we see that it's been more and more amplified because uh, if you look at the consumer experience if you're working with something and then you have to like for example you're, you're using a bank and you've used this bank for 20 years and then you have a question that you need to reach out to one of the support agents at the bank and you're stuck in a phone queue for 25 50 uh, two hours uh, in a, in a, and just don't get get forward. And the same thing goes for a company who's done a lot with employer branding. If they have a fantastic brand, fantastic culture, and then they have to go through a 25 minute or 45 minute application page with 25 different pages to go through, that's going to ruin all the, the fantastic job you've done in the past, building a fantastic culture yeah. and building a fantastic brand. Um, so, yeah. 
I mean, I mean, so, so, I mean that, that you know, uh, it it makes so much sense when you say it. It's still so fascinating, though, that not not all organizations are there for for various reasons, of course. Yeah. But so so, I mean, like looking into you guys, as you have so many organizations connected to Team Taylor, your your career sites and the uh, amazing application tracking systems. What would you say, like with the data and insights that you guys get, mm -hmm. what do successful employer brands do today that others do do not? Apart from maybe the whole delayed when you apply when it takes too long as one example what do successful employer brands do yeah so so i think first of all you have to understand that a lot of people tend to have a pretty narrow view and understanding of of candidate experience people only think the candidate experience is um like when a can, candidate applies for a job not just when they get rejected so it starts way before and it starts way after so you also have to understand yeah. that before you actually start understanding the touch points and that's one of the best things you need to do when you're when so the companies who've done the best thing here these are the companies who actually understand all the touch points and understand all of that to a deeper level but the, with a small disclaimer is that we work with so many different types of companies it's anything from small uh, small companies to massive companies in any single different types of industry and they're of course front runners in all of these industries but the common red thread among these the people that I found to be successful is that they dare to uh, to be different and they dare to be but mm. they are fearless and they really want to stand out they, they, and they're really real uh, to some extent, uh, they have a pretty defined communication strategy. They have a pretty fine, defined uh, way of communicating and branding themselves, and they have put in the effort in their culture and in their brand to actually stand out from the crowd. Uh, but you all and that just because because uh, I know that you've been saying that that and and those uh, communication efforts they do not necessarily have to be connected to to big budgets. No. Uh, so what I like. I think a lot of people tend to snow in on the big companies when they look at employer branding. It's the big companies like the Apples, the Facebooks, the, the whatever, who had unlimited pockets and a clear defined strategy and have done, done this for a while. They have a big campus where they have unlimited of, like benefits for everybody to use. But you also have to understand the global company landscape. The vast majority of these yeah. companies are not these global behemoths. These are companies with like 50 employees who are struggling to find the same talent that Apple and Facebook and all of these major corporations with endless pockets and a big, big strategy. Uh, so you have to understand that the vast majority of the companies which are on their employer journey are actually smaller companies who are starting off their yeah. journey on, on the process of building a culture and the process of building a, a defined strategy and stuff like this. And cool. um, so like, I think that's one of the most important things you have to help. And I think one of the things you, you have to understand there for those smaller companies to actually help you stand out from the crowd is something that Linus mentioned earlier in this call. You have to be real, you have to be transparent, you have to have authenticity. It's one of the most important yeah. things that you can do. But it's also that you have to dare to stand out a bit from the crowd. because. Uh, for a smaller company, you shouldn't maybe like at least in my opinion, you don't want to reach all the different uh, different people. You need to understand who do you want to have at your company. You need to understand your status quo with your culture, with your company. Understand why do your employees work there? What do they love about this company? What is this, uh, what is this that stands out and makes you unique? If a yeah. candidate's going to your career site or, or interacts with your company and thinks, man, this company is a bit too nerdy for me, uh, that might be a good thing because that might allow a really nerdy candidate to just find your, uh, your career site and be like, hallelujah, this is the place for me. And having one of those instead of five people are like, meh, this might be a good company is, is a relief because people will love and they will dedicate and they will be a, be a good, great culture fit and hopefully a great culture add-on as well, at least in my opinion. So that, that, that that's really good. So it's about I, I think about being courageous in that because I can imagine that, that many organisations are a little bit afraid of that. Mm -hmm. Like like you rather like be a, be a good fit for the many uh, than for the few, but the right ones. Yeah. Um, you, you know what? For, I know we have a couple of questions going, but there are there are some really interesting questions from from the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, Tina Taxis and she's asking, um, do you have any tips uh, on how to measure candidate experience data? Uh, what would be your take on that one? Yeah, so I think that, that candidate experience and actually measuring it is one of the most important things that's going to be a trend in the next upcoming decade. So you, there, uh, of course, I'm not the absolute expert. There are a lot of people that are better at this than me that do this on a day-to-day -day basis. But uh, you need to understand, first and foremost, the candidate drop-off. So how many candidates mm -hmm. see your website? How many people go through your website? Where do they stop? And how many people just yeah. leave out of nowhere and never come back? And if they leave, how do you can you re-engage? 
them to come back using some kind of remarketing or something like that. Um, understanding your actual time to offer or your time to hire is a specific way of looking at that, that as well, which is the time frame for a candidate once they've applied to the job versus to when they actually get the job or when they get rejected. If that takes too long, that will really give a bad, uh, bad experience to a lot of candidates because people are eager to get started and they always want the next new thing, especially among younger generations, the TikTok and the Snapchat generation, their, their attention span, they just want new next, next, next. So you have to be yeah. fast and efficient with that. Um, there are great ways of measuring through like surveys and candidate NPS platforms as well. I know that some mm -hmm. other ATSs uh, provide this. There are some great platforms out there that allow you to actually send out surveys or measure that. And, but you can also do that with a pretty small budget. Every single candidate mm -hmm. that you reject after a certain stage reach out to them, send them an email, do something to collect feedback. So this feedback yeah. is one of the most valuable things that you can do to actually measure and, and understand what's your faults, what's your strengths, and understanding that to start building a, a like more efficient uh, kind of experience. Uh, so and, and just in connection to, to, to a secondary question that we have here as well, I mean, it, it touches upon the first one, but, but you, you did speak about an narrow view of the candidate experience. Mm -hmm. and, and how would you say, how can you use data to create a positive experience, especially if a candidate gets uh, rejected? Anything in particular, like any, anything in detail there? So you can, can you repeat the question just so I understand? So I have time to, have uh, to think just to make sure that I, yeah, that yeah, I understand no. it no, correctly. It's all good. No, so the question is, how can you use data to create a positive experience, especially if a candidate gets rejected? So, so I think like understanding data and with, especially when the candidate gets rejected, what you, what you have to understand, I think it's one of the, our partners here in Sweden that, that tests is if, if you hire five people, and 95 people don't get the job, you want to make sure that all of these 100 people are ambassadors to your company, not just the five people yeah. who end up getting hired. So you want to be able to be progressive and actually follow through and actually have an ongoing discussion and then be open to feedback and actually give them some feedback um, to, to a certain extent when people get rejected and actually be fully transparent to why, what, and how. Uh, and just personalizing the communication to a certain extent, like all of these ATSs have the opportunity to send a person like a re reject email that says, hey, you didn't get the job. But a lot a lot of candidates tend to feel like they just get an email from a robot and the person didn't even read their CV. So actually taking the time to set up more templates, making sure that you have a clearer and more personalized communication and be more transparent and be more authentic or authentic, authentic yeah. uh, is a, such a key, key thing. And starting that, and you can start measuring those data points once you do that as well and get that in and then summarize that information to actually get a, a better candidate experience. Awesome. I mean, okay, so, so very like looking then into uh, the, the future, uh, what would you say, what are upcoming trends in regard to the candidate experience? We've seen a lot of development uh, up until now. What will happen moving forward, do you think? Yeah, so of course I'm biased, um, but, and I also want people to challenge me here because I haven't seen anything that is going to be like revolutionary, that's going to be like the next thing that just like flips everything on its head and just changes everything. I don't think AI is going to become that big in the next years at least, but it's also hard to tell because the last 10 years has changed so much. We don't know what's going to be, what the, what the workplace is going to be like in 2030. Uh, but you have to understand that the tech solutions are there to help you. And this is something that Lean has mentioned that, uh, something briefly about as well, that these IT solutions are there to help you and they actually want to make sure that you have more time to actually spend on your culture and your people and your candidates. They're there to save you time to make sure that you actually um, I can do it and you can actually collect data using them but you also have to understand that you must enjoy working in these solutions just imp implementing a solution just for the sake of implementing a solution and then not using it fully and not and taking detours uh, to get, make, maintain a good candidate experience that's going to be difficult because what, yeah. what, if you look back at it like uh, if you have five candidates in your application uh, like that have applied for your job it's quite easy for you to manage a great candidate experience with these five candidates mm. but as soon as the volume goes up to like a hundred 500 a thousand you need to be able to automate a lot of these things but still keep it personal and once you have the opportunity to have a really great tech stack that allows you to dedicate more time to your uh, to your to your team to your colleagues to your candidates and actually be more personal uh, that's a good thing but if you don't enjoy working in these solutions and you feel like you have to take a detour to maintain a good candidate experience then that's yeah, an issue uh, it's yeah, you must absolutely. enjoy it and it must be, be fun for you because otherwise it's going to be difficult for you to maintain that you might be able to do that for three months six months two years four years but after a certain extent you're just going to take the easy way out and that's going to end up in a poor candidate experience 
Oh, that's a really, really good point. Um, and I mean, I mean, j just to, to lay them out there, your, your top three recommendations, what would they be just real quick? Uh, so, so the biggest one is transparency, transparency, transparency. Uh, people, yeah. of course, want to see the best case scenario, but you have to be real. Uh, if you have a nerdy culture, highlight that. If you have a like a like a sporty culture, highlight that. Highlight your strengths and what makes you unique, and really make sure because those are the people you want to attract. And you're like there's a saying called "your vibe attracts your tribe," and you should really be able to highlight that. And you yeah. need to be fully transparent and authentic. The second one is tech is there to do uh, to help you, but tech is only there to help you if you do your homework and understand why you purchase something within tech. And just buying something, a uh, tech, tech solution won't magically solve all of your issues. But the upsides of using a, a HR tech, uh, tech is uh, really a uh, waste the downsides if it's done correctly. But for example, yeah. you need to enjoy using it. It needs to speak with your other solutions. It can't be something that just works alone. But going down into it, it, the benefit of it will really make sure that you have more time on your hands to actually uh, work, work on the most important things, your people, your culture, and your, your entire brand. And the final note is something that I think is going to come as a side effect of t using all of these tech solutions, which is data. Uh, the fact yeah. is that numbers don't really lie. And as soon as you, uh, if you collect data correctly, you can use that data to find your flaws, your strengths, and improve on that and have a constant improvement structure with your, uh, with your company on expanding your company culture and expanding your branding and understanding what works, what doesn't work, and actually always looking into yourself using this data to improve yourself. Freddie, thank you very much for that. We, we will be guided by those th top three recommendations. Thank you very much for, for giving us your insights. Uh, really, really valuable. All the best, my friend. Well, Poyan, what do you say about that one? Okay, so I have my notes right here. Um, yeah. And uh, no, that's oh, just, no, I it. that's uh, really, really interesting. Uh, what gets me, who is the ambassador? The 95% that didn't, the, didn't get the job. Really, really, really interesting. Uh, starting with, with Linus, the autobiography perspective, just love that. And the autodidactics, and uh, I got it. I have some <laughs> time training. Yes. Um, and Othan. Sorry? Authenticity. No, no, no. We'll take that next time for your planning. Sorry, sorry for that. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, soft perspective, top level management, twenty year plans, the context of the SVP. Really, really interesting to hear. And then I just love, love the very clear picture that Vasco was painting with a with a set goal, being pragmatic with the tactics, and make sure that every asset counts and use the community. That is exactly what we're trying to do here as yeah. well. So, yeah, I'm super happy. Thank you. Really, really great. And guys, there will uh, be a summary that will be sent out after the summit. We are reaching the very final minutes of today. Um, so the summit uh, uh, summary uh, will come with both information, obviously the recording as well. So the recording will be sent out. Uh, there will also be a new um, uh, a survey uh, coming out after the uh, summit. Uh, as mentioned at the very start, we want to improve for you guys and to create the best platform that we can together with really interesting engaging speakers that can give you guys tools to develop your own employer branding journeys. Uh, and Poyan, we will be back again. We, we will be back again. The employer branding summit is run to, uh, twice a year. Uh, so we will be back in the spring. You will, of course, be invited, all of you in this digital space today as well. One time in the fall, uh, end of 2021, new year, new feelings, new everything, new employer branding. Uh, so we will look very much to welcome you, uh, we look forward to welcome you guys back then. Thank you to everyone being here today. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you with love to our artwork team that makes us and our job so easy in this live session thank you everyone we hope to see you very very soon thank you bye <laughs>